In an instant, a false wall behind the Emperor retracts down into the floor, revealing a Mythic Dawn agent clad in conjured armor. He unsheathes his dagger and quickly approaches the reigning monarch. As he raises his blade, the lucky prisoner instinctively lunges forward and lifts the weapon that they had come across in the tunnels below. The clashing of metal rings loudly around the small room. The sounds of Boris and Glenroy, the members of the Blades, methodically cutting down the assassins leak into the small side room. Emperor Uriel Septon VII, old in age yet physically agile, sees the opportunity, takes out his short sword, and lodges it into the small opening near the cultist's breastplate. A loud cry echoes across the stony walls as the agent stumbles backwards. The prisoner winds up his weapon and delivers a fatal blow on the cultist. His armor instantly vanishes and the lifeless body collapses, hitting the floor hard. The sound of fighting quickly comes to an end in the neighboring open room. Boris re-enters into the side chamber and locks eyes with the prisoner. A small gleam of hope can be seen from the sole survivor of the royal guard. Emperor Uriel Septim VII stands tall and proud, yet humble and grateful. Boris breaks the short silence and says, Glenroy is dead, but we three should keep moving. The prisoner then hands the Amulet of Kings back to Uriel Septim and assures him that today is not the day that he dies. In today's discussion, we'll talk about the events and possibilities that could have come to fruition if Emperor Uriel Septim VII survived the assassination. Of course, there's going to be a lot of assumptions, hypotheticals, and theorizations in this video, so please sit back, enjoy, and take everything with a grain of salt. Also, I'd love to hear your take on the events that would unfold if Uriel Septim VII survived the Imperial Prison escape route. In the actual events of Oblivion, the player joins the Fellowship of Three Blades and the Emperor as they make their way through the Imperial City sublevels and sewers. The player's path diverges for a short while as they're introduced to several other mechanics and tutorials in the game. Eventually, they meet back up with the surviving three members and get stopped at a locked gate. It's here that Glenroy and Boris instruct the prisoner to guard the Emperor with their life, as those two then dart back off out into the open. The Emperor then says his final words to the player, telling them to find the last heir and to protect the Amulet of Kings. This is when the false wall behind him retracts, and a Mythic Dawn agent emerges to stab Uriel Septim, ending his life. The theory part of this video takes over from the introductory dialogue previously expressed. The Emperor survives the Mythic Dawn encounter within the side room, and the Amulet of Kings was handed back to Uriel Septim. The rest of this video will be told from a narrative point of view. Boris leads the Fellowship of Three, with the Emperor in the middle and the Prisoner at the back. Together, keeping a tight formation, they trudge through the Imperial sewers, occasionally hacking away at feral rats. Boris passes Glenroy's Akaviri Katana to the prisoner, claiming it to be the finest steel they'll ever come across, and that right now, they need to take up proper arms. The trio soon comes to a halt, as they lay eyes on a savage and crazed pack of goblins. One of them bears an iron war axe, and the other two flash their razor-sharp claws. Boris assertively and firmly commands a defensive formation, shielding the Emperor from any threats. Together, Boris and the prisoner clash with the goblins, slashing and blocking the creatures. Their battle stance is changing as these foes fight much differently from the assassins. However, with much ease, the goblins are disposed of. Reddish black sludge oozing from their bodies, the trio steps over the mutilated creatures and continues onward. Soon, they find themselves at the great gate that exits the sewers. They step outside and the great light of Magnus shines down on the group. Through slits, they open their eyes to gaze at the great wilds of Tamriel. Across the channel, they see the black road disappearing off into the distance. This is the pathway that leads to the great city of Shadenhall. Boris thinks the best idea is to swim across the upper Nibbin and travel north of the black road until they hit the city. Right now, no one can be trusted, so it's best they stay out of sight. Boris is optimistic they can make it there by nightfall. Once in Shadenhall, they lay low at an inn until more members of the Blades arrive. However, this is where Uriel chimes in and says that while he may still be quick with a blade, he wouldn't be able to keep up the pace while off-road or to make it there by nightfall. He then gazes at the prisoner, looking past the scuffed up clothing and cut up skin. He sees more than just a lesser man, and asks what their opinion is, and if they will continue to follow their destiny. The prisoner thinks for a moment, and agrees to continue on the journey. 
They also agree with the notion that off-roading to Shadenhall might not be the best idea. They bring up the possibility of obtaining horses, potentially even by committing theft, and asks about a possible safe house. Boris is hesitant about the idea, but the Emperor agrees with the prisoner on the grounds of efficiency. However, he claims that they won't need to steal anything as the gods are watching over them. Finally, the Emperor suggests heading in the direction of Coral to Wanyan Priory, as that's where Joffrey, the Grand Master of the Blades, resides. Again, Boris contests the idea, but Uriel Septim tells him to have faith in the Nine Divines, and that what will be, will be. The group devises a plan to walk the perimeter of the Imperial City Island, until they reach the western bridge connecting Wei to the Talos Plaza. While Boris and the prisoner are confident in their abilities to swim across the channel with the end goal of escaping the city limits sooner, they fear for the aquatic predators hunting the waters as well as for the Emperor's general safety. Boris insists on the three of them trading clothing in order to take attention away from the Emperor. However, yet again, the Emperor declines the idea and states that Destiny has other plans. So the group begins walking westward. They pass by multiple other sewer exits, as well as entrances to several caves. They frequently spot large mud crabs roaming the shores. The general philosophy though, is to not bother them if you don't wish to be bothered. The trio moves at a steady walking pace, reaching the western shores in around an hour's time, all the while making sure they haven't been followed by any more assassins. They eventually make their way up onto the bridge. Boris turns to the prisoner and gives strict instructions. No one can know their business, don't talk to anyone, as soon as they spot a horse, stop at nothing to get it, and protect the Emperor with your life. The trio begins walking west headed toward Wawit Inn. Fortunately for the Fellowship, the bridge is relatively empty with the occasional traveler passing by, or fishermen casting their lines. However, every single person stops to stare and mutters under their breath that it's Emperor Uriel Septim VII. A few of them even quickly rush back off to the city for reasons unknown. Boris calmly and lowly demands that the three get off the bridge as soon as possible. Safely and effectively, the trio finds their way to Wawa Inn and the settlement of Wei. It's now late afternoon and there's only a few more hours of daylight left with a lot of ground to cover still. Similar to the bridge, there are very few citizens around, but the group is attracting a lot of attention with their appearances. With a great deal of luck, Two Imperial Legionnaires are patrolling from the Red Ring Road and are approaching their location. Boris turns to the prisoner and exclaims that now is the chance to get the horses and ride to Coral. He waves down the riders and begins talking to them. The prisoner and the Emperor are standing a little further back. The Emperor turns to the prisoner and begins discussing Destiny and the Nine Divines in a little more detail than what was discussed in the sub-levels. It's here as well that it's revealed he has another son the last heir of the Septim dynasty named Martin. Martin lives in Kavach serving at the temple of Akatosh. The Emperor instructs the prisoner to find him and bring him to safety as soon as they get the first chance to. It's now that the conversation between Boris and the Legionnaires begin to turn more aggressive and hostile. The Legionnaires are refusing to give up their horses as Boris also refuses to give them a good explanation of why they should. The prisoner glances back towards the bridge and something catches their eye. One wood elf, a high elf, and two humans are briskly crossing the bridge. Something seems off about them and the way they're carrying themselves. Their gaze is completely set on the Emperor. All the meanwhile, Boris is still arguing with the Imperial riders and they even begin to turn their horses around to continue patrolling. At this point, the strange citizens are about halfway across the bridge. The prisoner turns to inform the Emperor, but he is already looking at the potential threat too. The Emperor makes his way over to a frustrated Boris and begins speaking to the Legionnaires. At first, they're dismissive of whom they believe to be an imposter or actor. However, maybe it was them seeing reason, or perhaps the dragon blood of the Emperor having an influence, or some divine intervention by the gods themselves. Whatever it was, the two men stepped off their horses and bowed down before Emperor Uriel Septim VII, apologizing profusely. It's here that Boris and the prisoner get onto one horse, and the Emperor mounts the other. Before they could set off though, the mysterious group of four reaches the edge of the bridge. In a quick and unison motion, the four raise their hands and conjure a set of Mythic Dawn armor. They begin to sprint at the trio, and the elves let loose a flurry of magicka attacks. 
One bolt of lightning strikes an Imperial Legionnaire, wounding him greatly. The other rushes the cultists, raising his steel longsword and steel shield, ready to lay down his life. The trio begins galloping away, just barely evading fireballs and icicles. The speed of the warhorses is simply too great for the assassins to even try and catch up. As the prisoner turns around to take one last look, they witness the legionnaires cut down and killed, but not without taking two members of the mythic dawn with them. The other two members simply stood still and watched the horses gallop towards the city of Coral. The road ahead was rather uneventful for the trio. They would ride past several forts like Fort Nickel and Fort Ash. Here, they would glimpse mercenaries clad in a mismatch of fur, leather, and iron armors. Their weapons chipped, cracked, and held together by sinew. They didn't seem to mind the trio, however, so long as they did not approach the forts, plus, they were simply riding too fast to be stopped. By now, the sun was low enough that it expressed deep purple and magenta colors dancing across the skies. The trio would pass Odil Farm, and finally, they arrived at Wanyan Priory just outside of Coral. The stable hand, Aranor, was one foot inside Wanyan Lodge when he heard the galloping coming from the eastern road. He quickly turned around and spotted the three riders coming to a halt outside of the manor. Irritated, he lets out a deep sigh and goes to inform the visitors that everyone has turned in for the night and to come back tomorrow. As soon as he makes his way over and is about to speak, a confident, wise, and stern voice behind him says, By the Nine, Sire, why have you come? Aranor turns to see Brother Joffrey, kneeling before the group of three. Puzzled, he looks back at the riders and notices that one of them is donning the armor of the blades, another one for some reason is dressed with rough and scuffled sack clothing and looks completely out of place, the other looks strikingly like royalty with the robe, jewelry, and charismatic wisdom. Could it be? No, surely not the emperor, he thinks to himself. But wait, it, it could be. It must be. It has to be. He stands there in shock, not moving. By now, Brother Joffrey is ushering the trio inside quickly, being caught up to speed by Boris on the events that transpired. The trio is offered a change of clothes, food, and water. The monks all try to go above and beyond for the Emperor, but he declines offers of anything more. A plan is now devised within the Priory on how to proceed next. Joffrey takes the role of leadership from Boris, as he far outranks the young Redguard. Joffrey says the next move is to safely bring the Emperor to Cloud Ruler Temple just north of Bruma. Boris agrees while the Emperor and prisoner sit in silence. The prisoner is simply taking in everything that is currently happening. Just this morning, they were serving a prison sentence within the Imperial City Prison, and now they're escorting Emperor Uriel Septim VII to safety. On the other hand, Uriel Septim seems checked out of the conversation. There is something else very clearly on his mind, yet no one else in the room can tell. At this point, the plan has been set to where following the first light of the next morning, the group would set out for Cloud Ruler Temple. Before going to bed, the Emperor pulls the prisoner aside and asks of them for a favor. He reiterates the existence of a final heir to the Septim dynasty, Martin Septim who lives in Kavach. Martin does not know anything of his true heritage and serves Akatosh at the chapel. He then asks for the prisoner to instead travel south to Kavach, seek him out, and lead him to Cloud Ruler Temple as quickly as possible. It is here that the prisoner agrees, whether through an act of destiny, fate, honor and duty, or by simply wanting to do the right thing. Tossing and turning all night, the prisoner ponders what exactly the gods have in store for them. They've been led on this ludicrous adventure, and they think, where does it end, and how far will they have to go? All of a sudden, the smell of burning wood and hay fills their nostrils. It's a strong and smoky scent. Then, in a horrific and terrifying manner, a guttural scream echoes across the surrounding buildings. In an instant, the monks, Joffrey, Boris, and the prisoner shoot out of their beds and rush to the windows. In pure fright, they witness at least eight red-robed figures tossing torches on the roof of Wanyan Lodge, the door now barred by tough, sturdy pieces of wood. The screams are produced by the stable hand, Aranor, whom is now locked within the fiery inferno. At once, Joffrey barks orders to Brother Piner and Prior Maberil to gather arms as fast as possible and head outside. He then tells Boris to guard the Emperor and then makes way downstairs. 
Boris, clearly frustrated with having to stand idle, delegates the prisoner to watch the Emperor. His reasoning is that the three monks, including Joffrey, are still no match for the mass numbers outside. He then quickly exits the manor and joins the fighting. Calm and quickly, the Emperor states that there's no time and that the prisoner must leave at once to find Martin. Uriel says that his fate is within the hands of the Nine now and that the prisoner still has many more deeds and actions to carry out within their lifetime. The prisoner abides by Uriel's commands and sneakily leaves the manor, as to try not to attract any attention. Once outside, the roaring of flames and the clashing of steel deafens their ears. Several bodies of the cultists lay on the ground. Near them, the head of Prior Maveril is rocking back and forth. The expression on the face is fright, and the body is nowhere to be seen. The prisoner hastily runs for the stables, trying to secure a horse before being seen. They're able to corral one and set off in the direction of Kavach. The fate of those at Wenyan Priory is left unknown. The prisoner rides through the Imperial Reserve, passing many abandoned forts and alien ruins. The forests and hills are filled with creatures and animals that in some ways are scarier than the cultists. In the darkness of night, the prisoner hears unfamiliar footsteps and noises chasing after them. At some points, they even sounded directly behind the warhorse. However, the bread for battle stallion was just barely able to outpace whatever followed behind. They arrive at the city of Kavach in the late morning. Tired, yet focused, they hand their mount over to Kavach's stable and enter into the great city. Kavach was beautiful. The architecture was similar to that of Skingrad's, yet more open and inviting. The people were lively and friendly. Town Square was bustling with traders, citizens, entertainers, and guards. Kavach's great sigil was plastered on banners hanging off of posts and establishments. Songs were sung across the city, and the noises of laughter and cheer overcame the chaos. Inns, taverns, and general stores were full of citizens engaging in their affairs. Standing tall and proud, close to the southern gate, the Temple of Akatosh gleamed in the morning light. The prisoner made their way to the chapel and entered inside. They immediately began asking around for Martin. Many folks praised Martin highly, saying that he's a true and honest embodiment of what a religious leader should be. The prisoner is soon directed over to the great altar where Martin could be seen silently reading. The prisoner walks over and engages with Martin. Martin while humble and friendly, respectfully dismisses the prisoner, saying that they are surely mistaken and that he is but a simple priest. He ultimately refuses to follow the prisoner because the story is just so outlandish. The prisoner exits the chapel and attempts to regain their thoughts. How could they convince Martin of the truth? At this moment, a Breton male bumps into the prisoner and excuses themselves. He appears to be walking with a female high elf and the two enter inside of the chapel. Within moments, citizens run outside of the church and scream for the guards. The prisoner rushes back in to see two members of the mythic dawn, conjured in complete armor, cutting down everyone inside in an attempt to figure out which one is Martin. The prisoner rushes over amidst the chaos and once again urges Martin to follow along. They explain that if Martin stays, he dies, and there are bigger events at play than he could possibly ever imagine. Martin agrees to follow along and the two rush up along the left side of the chapel. Blocking their way is a member of the mythic Don whose mace is dripping with blood. The prisoner pulls out their Akaviri katana and engages in a duel, ultimately besting the assassin. The two make their escape and head for the southern gate, all the meanwhile being followed by the other assassin. At some point, multiple members of the city guard single out the assassin and begin intervening blocking them from further following Martin and the prisoner. Exiting the city, several other citizens conjure their cultist armor and attempt to make chase, but are also blocked off by the guards at the gate. Martin is in complete shock about the events that just unfolded, the temple, and its citizens being desecrated. With a bearing of slightly northeast, the horse rides until nightfall. The duo arrive back at Wanyan Priory to not only see the outcome of the battle, but to check for any survivors. Astonishingly, there are no bodies to be found, alive or dead. The lodge is completely burned down, the chapel charred and cracked, and the manor is a complete mess. Still, there are no signs of life to be found anywhere, even the stables. Perhaps this was the doing of the victors, whether the Blades or the Mythic Dawn. 
Or maybe the Coral Guard launched an investigation, removing the bodies. Either way, the duo deems it best to rest here for the night. They exchange stories and information for quite some time before getting some sleep. At first light, the duo hops back on the horse and sets out on the journey due northeast. They take the orange road bordering the Great Forest. The ride itself takes roughly a third of the day to reach the Silver Road heading north to Bruma. The road was fairly void of any danger with the odd Imperial soldier patrolling their routes. From the Silver Road to Cloud Ruler Temple, it was roughly now late afternoon. The duo finally arrives at the temple walls, but are denied entrance inside. The station guards are not familiar with the prisoner nor Martin. All of a sudden, a booming, angered voice yells for the gates to open, and out comes Boris. Boris is beyond angry with the prisoner, denying them entrance here, inside the temple, and even threatening to kill them on the spot. He claims that they left them all to die by riding off the night the Priory was attacked. Prior Maberil, Brother Piner, Aranor, and Joffrey all lost their lives. Boris and the Emperor were just barely able to escape. The prisoner attempts to explain the situation, but Boris refuses to listen. They are, however, able to convince Boris that Martin needs to seek an immediate audience from the Emperor. Thus, Martin is allowed inside Cloud Ruler Temple, and the prisoner is ultimately turned away. For now, that's where the detailed story of the immediate events for Uriel surviving the prison attack end. Soon after, the prisoner would get sought out and invited into the temple as soon as Boris gets caught up on Martin's lineage. From here, there would be several quests involving the prisoner learning more about the mythic dawn, ultimately trying to destroy the cult. The main antagonist would be the cult and its leader, Mancor Cameron. Mayrun's Dagon would not be allowed to undergo his invasion, as someone with the dragon blood is still wearing the Amulet of Kings, Uriel Septim VII, and thus, the dragon fires are still lit. That is by far the biggest change of events that would happen. Ultimately, the cult would be vanquished, Uriel would live, and so would Martin. Martin would learn the ways of nobility and become the successor of the Empire. The Septim dynasty would live on through Martin and his heirs. Interestingly, the age would still stay as the Third Era. Uriel would go on to live around 105 and pass away due to health complications. The prisoner would still receive honors from the Elder Council from their performed deeds, but the rest of their legacy is unknown. The possibility of Daedric invasion is always present in this timeline. The Amulet of Kings still exists, Martin has the dragon blood within him, and so the dragon fires stay lit, but the veil between Mundus and Oblivion still remains thin and penetrable if the Akatosh Covenant is broken. The Septim Dynasty would continue to rule for the foreseeable future. With that, the theory surrounding Uriel Septim VII's survival at the beginning of Oblivion comes to an end. The major changes from the canon events include him continuing to rule and dying of old age. Martin successfully becomes the successor to Uriel and continues the Septim Dynasty of Rule, fulfilling his destiny of becoming Emperor. The Amulet of Kings still exists, and whomever wears it must be worthy enough in order to prevent a Daedric invasion which could still happen should the dynasty die out or the amulet is removed. Mehrun's Dagon was never able to begin his invasion in this theory. The amulet was always worn by Uriel Septim, and only for a split moment was it removed when given to the prisoner at the beginning. However, in this theory, I didn't feel as though it was long enough to begin opening Oblivion Gates. Joffrey perishes in this theory. He lays down his life defending the Emperor from the group of cultists at the Priory. Kvach as a city was whole and thriving. The prisoner gets to experience an alive and healthy city. The cultists do attack towards the end of their stay, but it's nothing more than a brief showdown with the guards. Finally, of course there were little details changed about the interactions and routes the prisoner embarked on as per the main quest, but it did still follow the travels in the canon events that the prisoner is tasked with. From the sewers to Coral, from Coral to Kvach, from Kavach back to Coral, and then from Coral to Bruma. The Mythic Dawn was still heavily involved with this plot, as now, they are the sole main antagonists. Without the Oblivion Gates and Daedra, they are the only ones to stand against the Emperor's line and the Amulet. 
the quests the prisoner would embark on in the theoretical events would likely parallel the ones in the canon events, with emphasis on still finding out information on the cult and where to find Mankar Cameron. With this theory, I had to take a lot of creative liberties on where the story would go. While we can make decent assumptions, it's never specifically stated on what was to happen next after escaping the Imperial sewers. I tried my best to stay true to the characters and their personalities. In truth, there's 1001 different ways that the events could have unfolded. Perhaps Boris dies in the sewers. Maybe the trio ended up going to Shadenhall in the first place. Maybe they chose to head straight for Cloud Ruler Temple. Along the road, who's to say that a bandit didn't fire a well-placed arrow between the eyes of Boris or in the chest of the Emperor? Maybe those brief moments with the Amulet of Kings removed in the beginning, an Oblivion Gate or two were opened. Maybe Martin ends up dying in the chapel attack at Kavach. These are all ideas, including many more, in which I thought about adding into the theory. I'm certainly no writer, nor do I have what it takes to create a video game plot, but these are some of my subjective views on what might happen if Uriel Septon VII wasn't assassinated. To be honest, making this video has shown me that his death sets up the game and series in a much more fascinating light than I previously thought. It really advances the plot and RPG elements present within the game. Now that I've told my beliefs on what could happen if he survived, I'd love to hear how your perspective of the story unfolds. In your eyes, what happens if Emperor Uriel Septim VII survived the sewers? I'd also love to hear your opinion on how accurate you think my events would be. Until next time, keep on adventuring.